Welcome to Spread the Light, where we use the power of our own stories of lived experience to help dispel stigma and stereotypes as they relate to mental health, and instead spread hope and light. I'm your host, Dr. David Gabushan. I'm a pediatrician, a public health practitioner, a parent, an immigrant from India by way of the Philippines, and also somebody with lived experience with bipolar disorder. Today, I'm really, really excited to welcome to the show Emmy Neatfeld. She's a journalist, a mental health activist, the author of Acceptance, a memoir, a journey from foster care and homelessness to Harvard and big tech. As a journalist, she writes for The New York Times, The Atlantic, Slate, and has been passionate about critiquing unrealistic expectations of, quote, resilience put on vulnerable youth. She lives in New York City with her family and stuffed animals. Welcome to the show, Emmy. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Davika. So Emmy and I first crossed paths when her New York Times piece, which went viral, came out in December. It was called, I Edited Mental Illness Out of My College Applications. And it really focused on that really pivotal de decision that millions of youth have to face every single year about how to contend with explaining a gap or a set of less than perfect experiences on an application that have to do with an experience with mental illness or other adversity. Using that as our jumping off point, can you talk through that piece and also how your journey began. Yes, absolutely. Ever since I applied to college back in 2009 to 2010, I have been really passionate about the way that college admissions works, particularly for youth from kind of non-traditional backgrounds and youth who have dealt with mental health issues. And I had a really complicated childhood and adolescence and I had to explain it when I was 16 and 17 years old and had to learn how to kind of package this complicated story that included parental neglect, my parents' mental illness, but also my own mental health struggles, including like hospitalization, self-harm, and eating disorder. And it was very grueling, even though 80% of foster youth have significant mental right. health issues. Um, it felt like colleges wanted like diverse candidates, but didn't necessarily want some of the aftermath that comes with those right. experiences. Written about how being a foster youth was of interest to admissions committees, scholarship committees, et cetera. And sort of the, the subtext of that was not, right? The mental health issues, the psychiatric admission, and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah, I felt like there was so much pressure to be kind of this perfect mm. victim and be somebody who could check a box for them, but who wasn't going to need anything special or require special right. support. I think that's a devastating thing to, to go through as a young person. And for me, it was definitely worse because nobody was talking about it. And I think it would have been really helpful to have somebody that I could see publicly who was like, hey, I've been there. I had to make these like edits in my application. And you know what? It's okay. And you're still a whole person. Mm. Uh, so that's why I'm really, uh, really excited to be here talking to you and really believe in your mission of kind of just blasting that stigma. Absolutely. And really owning all of those parts of ourselves, not just the ones that look shiny and clean and buttoned up to an admissions committee, right? But really everything that we walk through to make us who we are today. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it can get really, it gets really complicated for teenagers and children who are still going through that phase of like, what is my identity? Right. And we live in a society where, you know, people are told that college admissions is like based on who you right. are and like your college application is your chance to like show them your true right. self. And that's such an unrealistic expectation. Yeah. Like we wouldn't say that for a job. Right. Oh, you know, this job is based on your whole self. I think as adults, it's a little easier to kind of have that distance. This is my like personal life and this is my professional life. Right. And then be able to like think intentionally about those boundaries and that sharing. 
it's so much harder when you're younger and you haven't been through right that. especially when adults and peers are telling you that this this reflects all of you and you know all of us know that it has to be a strategic sharing process and telling of a story in a very certain way and so it just does a lot of harm, I think, to many people and their lived experience to feel like there's certain parts of themselves that are not worthy of being told and worthy of seeing the light or that people might look away or say no to you because of that if you do show up as your fullest and truest self. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, like, I was told that my mental health issues were were basically because of me, you know, that I was not strong enough, that I was bad, mm. that I should have been able to deal with what was going on mm. at home. And if I had tried harder, I would have been able to. And like those messages can make it so hard to say like, no, the problem mm -hmm. isn't me. And even if I'm dealing with these conditions, it doesn't reflect on me as a right. person, right? Like it's not a personality flaw. It's a medical condition or a, a mental health thing everybody struggles with. Um, and so I, I wish that I could go back and tell my younger self, like, it is not your fault. Mm. It's totally natural that when bad things happen to us, we respond. Like, that is part of what makes us human. And that's totally okay. Absolutely. Yes. You've written about how we have this very unrealistic system in terms of holding the individual singly responsible for their failures, their successes, and the harm that that really does in not acknowledging all of the structural constraints and real setups for the experiences that we have early on and in our lives in general. And so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about kind of that theme and also how stigma and discrimination would show up for you in your life. I think so much of this stems from the fact that we live in an individualist culture and we have so much invested in this idea of meritocracy and the just world hypothesis where good things happen to mm -hmm. good people. And we're just inundated with these stories of people who overcome the odds, right? Who are told by their doctor, like, oh, you're never going to walk again. And they are able to walk and we get this narrative that reflects on them as a person that they're a good person and some who doesn't like defy expectations is somehow bad. And I think that that shows up a lot in therapy, unfortunately, yeah. particularly for people who are like lower income or seeing therapists who might not have the same amount of training as a higher paid, higher income environment. Unfortunately, I was really exposed to that when I was trying to get help mm. and this idea of only I was responsible for my behavior, for my emotions, for my depression or my eating disorder. Um, right. And I think that that's an important thing that we should be talking about, about how, you know, it is so important for people to have agency mm -hmm. and to help people recognize what their agency is. It's also important to be aware of the harm right. that can come from um, placing this burden like squarely on the individual. I felt like when I told adults what was happening for me at home, like my mom was a hoarder, <laughs> there was gaslighting happening mm. and emotional abuse, that the more honest I was, the less people trusted mm. me. And I found that as I moved through the system of getting medication and receiving diagnoses, that unfortunately, Sometimes doctors would trust me less because I had received a specific diagnosis. Mm. Like a lot of traumatized young people, I was given this borderline personality mm. diagnosis, right? Because I was self-harming, I struggled with my emotions. And, you know, borderline personality disorder is a thing that many people are diagnosed right. with. It should not carry, like, a stigma with it or a like judgment to people who have it. And also I experienced so much judgment from having that in my file. Right. It's a place where I really hope that therapy and medicine like moves forward mm -hmm. because it, for me, it was like I was given this diagnosis or I was prescribed antipsychotic medication. And then people saw that in my chart and then treated me in a certain way because of it. Absolutely. We want people to seek help and like get treatment. 
And I also hope that people in the future receive better treatment than I got or than so many um, people right now are getting in part because of just like their socioeconomic status or their demographics, um, how that could really, really lead to discrepancies in in what people go through. Yeah, it's such a striking example. I think borderline personality disorder, like bipolar disorder, I mean, there there's a set of very loaded stereotypes that accompany these terms. And unfortunately, when you show up as a patient with one of these descriptors in your file, so do all of those stereotypes. And unfortunately, the people who we trust with our medical care are also humans with biases and have you know, access to all of the same stereotypes that exist in the world about these disorders. And so then you start as a patient feeling less than, right? When you show up for something completely unrelated to your mental health, having a label on your chart in that way can sometimes make you a more, quote, difficult patient, one who's less trusted with symptoms that you're bringing in. And there's all kinds of really good evidence to show that folks with mental health diagnoses actually get treated very differently for physical health symptoms because their experiences are invalidated and not believed to a greater extent. And there is good data on that, which is really damning of our system for sure. That's so horrible, especially because being exposed to certain mental health stressors can really put people at risk for other physical health conditions. Absolutely. Yeah. People with serious mental illness are dying today two decades sooner, not just because of suicide, which is directly related to their mental health trajectory, but also to kind of the chronic stress that they experience in the world that then shows up in the form of chronic medical illness like diabetes and heart disease and dying sooner because of things like heart attacks and strokes. Cancer shows up at earlier ages and may be more progressive than it might otherwise have. And part of it is the way in which stress is embedded in the brain and the body. But a lot of it is actually the, some of these structural factors that we're talking about, how when you go to a doctor with early symptoms of a long-term physical illness, you may not be assessed as quickly, right? And it may progress for longer. And then when you do get that diagnosis of cancer, it's much later on. Yeah, it's so hard. Like I I have chronic Mm -hmm. pain and there's a clear link between trauma and chronic pain. And also for years, you know, I would see the doctor and it would be like, this is part of having post-traumatic stress disorder, Right. right? It makes you more sensitive. And that can stop you from looking at like life factors, environmental factors, root causes. Right. Like if somebody just tells you it's psychosomatic, you're not going to be like, oh, maybe I should stop wearing those tight mm, jeans, right. right? which really they can, I wore tight jeans the other day and I was like, wow, okay, this is what I was going through a few years ago, right? It wasn't in my right. head. It was these pants. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> From your New York Times piece, you say the same crisis that leads to an outpouring of support for a wealthy child might cause a foster youth to be sent to a locked facility, prescribed antipsychotics, and forced to change schools. How unfair is that? Super unfair. It's super unfair. And, you know, I talked to 11 different students for this piece, coming from a really wide range of backgrounds, races, ethnicity, income levels, and I expected to see a huge difference in mental health conditions people were struggling with. But what I found was actually the students' experiences were much more similar than I expected, but the reaction to those experiences and the consequences for those experiences was much Mm. wider. There's a whole system that that protects people who have power. Um, And, you know, these are children, right? I think all children should be protected. Mm -hmm. And it seemed just so very unfair that if you go through a mental health hospitalization at a like elite private school, they will make it sound like you had a concussion Mm -hmm. or mono Mm -hmm. um, versus like at a lot of schools, it's just like too bad. So sad. We're not going to count any grades from when Mm. you were there. Even when the law says that this is not okay, it's something that that happens and that most people don't actually recognize happens. Right. right? They assume like, okay, if you're poorer, you must be sicker. Mm or it must be impacting you in some way that's more dangerous or scary. Uh, if you're coming from a place of like comfort, 
and, you know, a middle class, like white American, it's kind of hard to imagine having a crisis, you know, and then being like taken against your will to a locked facility and having your life turned upside down. Right. Like that's really hard to imagine, even though it's something that happens all the time. And I think it's crucial for admissions officers and college counselors and teachers to know that range of experiences so that when you're writing a letter, when you're looking at an application, or even when you're just deciding how to treat somebody, you recognize like, oh, it's not just this person's mental health issue or their mind. Like it's this whole society that responds to different people very differently. Absolutely. And I remember one uh, really salient point from your piece, which was that, you know, admissions counselors are trying to say, like, how can we protect ourselves from headlines in the future? And you make the excellent point that when you walk through experiences of poor mental health from an early age, you build coping skills, you build tools in your arsenal to really be able to stay well, to know what to do when you start to experiencing symptoms again, right? And so if you're screening out those kinds of people, and instead letting in people who may be naive to mental illness, right? Like they haven't had to contend with mental health symptoms yet. And so they may actually struggle more so than somebody who has already built an arsenal of, of tools around mental health. Absolutely. I love that you bring that up because I think it's, it's very naive on college's part to think that just because somebody isn't disclosing or isn't forced to disclose a mental health condition that they haven't yeah. had one. And that, you know, there's a lot of evidence that mental health conditions tend to emerge during the time of college. Uh, I spoke to some people for the story who, who specifically put off seeking treatment in high mm -hmm. school because they were worried that it would affect mm -hmm. their college applications. Mm -hmm. And those people had some of the hardest times in right. college because we, like you and I know that it can take years to find the right therapist, the right medication to kind of stabilize. Uh, if it's possible for that to happen before showing up on campus, it se seems like a win all around. Absolutely. Not um, to say that either camp of person isn't worthy of acceptance as a person, but acceptance into, into colleges and other opportunities and worthy of help. But saying that one camp of persons who has already experienced it is somehow going to, to be a red flag in a way that nobody else is. If there's a lot of layers of uh, stigma, but also lack of truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was curious to know how you think your mental health journey has molded your superpowers. I'm really glad you asked that. And, you know, my journey w was complicated. It was one thing when I was a teenager and I was dealing with some really intense issues around self-harm and eating and also around getting treatments that weren't exactly effective. Uh, then I had kind of a different experience as an adult. It took me years to get treatment for PTSD and some depression that came with that after some of my negative experiences earlier on. Uh, and I think that that complexity has given me a lot of empathy and has helped me see not only mental health, but the world as just a very complicated place where a lot of things that seem like they can't coexist can be true at once. Right. Um, and where I just, I see other people and I think everybody is a mystery, mm. right? In ways that we often try to reduce people into like, oh, you're good, mm. you're bad. Like it's this one common narrative that we know. Um, but most people's lives aren't like that. Um, and so as a journalist, I feel really grateful that I'm able to uncover those mm. stories and tell those stories and then also look like one layer beneath kind of the conventional mm. wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. If you all who are listening and watching have not read Emmy's work to date, you really should. She's a very nuanced and excellent writer and journalist. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's what I've always wanted to do since I was a teenager. And I feel really grateful to be able to tell these stories that are not being told, especially as there's greater awareness about a youth mental health crisis and an adult mental health crisis to really point out some of the gaps in reporting and how the narrative does seem to focus on certain 
populations who usually have more wealth and resources, but are not everybody in America. And really focus, too, on those stories of kind of individual exceptionalism, right? Discounting all of the other factors that there are in the mix. Absolutely, yeah. And even when you meet really exceptional individuals, like, there's always a society behind them and systems that force them to be so exceptional, sometimes at great cost mm, to them. Absolutely. What are you most proud of as you look back? I'm really proud of my book, Acceptance. I wanted to write it ever since I was applying for college and going through that grueling experience of marketing mm. myself. Uh, I'm proud of it in part because I went back and I looked at a lot of experiences in my life that I would have preferred to never touch again. I went through thousands of pages of medical records and really built this understanding of the child welfare system and the teen mental health system that, uh, you know, frankly, I never wanted to know about, but that it forced me to grow so much as a person mm -hmm. and to really make peace with stuff as much as right. I could. Um, right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm proud of just being willing to go back there again and again mm. and again for seven years uh, until I could make something of it that people would understand. Mm. What was that process like for you over those seven years of confronting those really, really hard parts of your own journey and really finding it within yourself to pick out those nuggets, the distillation of the details and the overall arc that you think other people could have learned from. First time that I got a set of medical records, I was sitting on the bus coming home from work and I read a few sentences describing me where people were saying that I was histrionic and dramatic. Mm. And I remember just slamming my laptop shut and being like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this project. Like I was a bad person. I'm going to have to show the world how terrible I was. I was just really filled with mm -hmm. guilt. A few days later, I was like, okay, well, I could either quit or I can read this and try to come to terms yeah. with it. I had hundreds of experiences mm -hmm. like that. And it really required um, learning how to view things from different points mm -hmm. of view and recognizing like, you know, that, that was like this set of medical professionals point of view, but that's not my perspective. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to be my perspective mm -hmm. and that shouldn't mm. be my perspective. But it just requires like taking into account a lot of things at once and uh, still maintaining this like fierce empathy for my younger mm. self. That's so poignant. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, really acknowledging that just because somebody with a degree and with a white coat has written something down in a chart that it's not truth with a capital T, right? That... I rotated through psych wards and some of what happens, you know, in those treatment conversations and behind the scenes is an assessment and a judgment of who that person is and where they are in their journey, what their decisions are like, you know, and there's a way in which sometimes inappropriate truth telling and inappropriate judgments get, get called on in that process that just mm -hmm. I think end up doing a little bit of damage to the patient provider relationship, but also to the, the patient's experience and their ability to craft their own truth and narrative. Right. So I, it's just, it's a very interesting thing that happens. And I'm sure you saw it, as you said, in hundreds of pages. And somehow we think that that's part of the treatment, the very, very loaded judgmental pieces of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I appreciate, you know, it's always healing to like talk to doctors and medical professionals. And, you know, I have so much empathy and like respect for what you do. And I think when you're seeing these records, it's like the people making these judgments are not, they're typically not bad people. Right. There's a strong system of incentives where it's in like order to receive payment. Like there has to be a diagnosis. Yes. There has, there's a system in place and doctors are one one part of that system and often have to fight to maintain humanity right. in the face of bureaucracy. Right. Right. Um, absolutely. So it's like a shared struggle that we all have. Definitely. Yeah. What, what's one myth in the mental health space that you would like to bust for us? I really want to end this myth that being healthy 
or recovered or successful means not being affected by the journey or by the bad things that might have led Mm -hmm. someone there. I think we're addicted to this story of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And these people who have been transformed by tragedy into absolute superheroes. And I have a lot of respect for those people. It's amazing that they're able to do that. Um, But for most people, the truth is more complicated. And I really think that that's okay. Yes. Amen. And I even think for those who look perfect on the outside, I think the truth is usually more complicated for them too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thinking about where you are today, what are some of your tips and tricks for staying well? For me, my physical environment is really important. And part of this might be because I grew up in a home with a lot of hoarding, but it just makes me feel so much happier to be in a room with plants and light. And a lot of that is a luxury. And I'm also glad that as I've gotten older, I've learned how to prioritize putting up a picture that matters to me and trying to take care of my space. It's like especially important when I'm in a place where like, I have to stay home a lot or I'm not feeling well. If I'm going to be spending a lot of time at home, it really boosts up my mood to be in a nice Mm. space. And the other thing for me that was a huge game changer was sleep. It's a struggle for me to like stay asleep through the night. I have a kind of a weird sleep schedule. In college, I read a book that inspired me to make getting enough sleep my number one Mm. priority. Like, even if it meant getting a bad grade on an assignment, I was like, I have Mm -hmm. to do it. And that was the first time that I, in years, that I remembered not feeling suicidal. Mm. Like, I had just had, like, this buzz in my head of, like, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die. And I didn't even really realize that it was Mm -hmm. there until I, like, went to bed, slept for, like, 10 hours, and then woke up and was like wow, where is that? Like, where did that go? Like, how do I just feel, how do I feel so much more okay Mm. today than I felt yesterday? That's Um, powerful. I think often it can be easy to, to lose sight of things like sleep and exercise and food. And there's so many reasons why it can be really hard to get enough of them. And also they can be so important. Mm -hmm. And I would really love to see policies and just changes to society that make it easier for people to have more of those things that nurture their mental and physical health. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for naming those things. I think those are really, really powerful on the individual level as well as on the population level. You know, when I was working in state government in California at the office of the California Surgeon General, one of the programs that we put into place was called the ACEs Aware Initiative. So this is a statewide um, restructuring of really how we look at healing from childhood trauma. It actually equips healthcare providers and community-based organizations to kind of work together to make sure that anybody who is at risk of experiencing toxic stress, which is when you go through difficult experiences as a child, your brain and your bodies can kind of get stuck in survival mode, right? From your brain down to your toes, different kinds of systems in your body, immune system and your inflammatory cascades, your hormones, etc., can be impacted. But we know about these evidence-based behavioral strategies to really reverse toxic stress. A lot of them are the ones that you're talking about. So sleep, getting enough of it, right? Getting high quality sleep every single day, exposure to nature, just like you're talking about with having plants in a space that you call your own, being able to walk outside that actually can reverse biologically a lot of these impacts. Exercise, anti-inflammatory nutrition, connection to people in your life, whether that's, you know, family, chosen family, friends, colleagues, uh, meditation and mindfulness practices are also on that list. But essentially, it's a program that helps to educate healthcare personnel to really understand the physiology that early adversity can lead to, so that they can then treat patients who are coming into them for, let's say, diabetes or heart disease or depression differently 
based on the understanding that their toxic stress may be actually causing some of those symptoms and that needs to be regulated or treated more specifically in order to help with that diabetes or the heart disease management. Wow, thank you for working on that initiative. It sounds really powerful and game-changing for someone. Thanks. This has been such an inspiring and wonderful conversation. I'm wondering what your hopes are for our collective future. Not a small question to send you out. I hope that we can move to a world with greater equality. Inequality has really been on the rise, racial, economic, all of it. And I think it's really harming everybody's mental health and physical health to be on that path. I really, really hope that we can move towards a better place. And I also hope that as Americans, we can learn how to recognize and value interdependence and also cherish vulnerability just as much as we cherish these narratives of single-handed overcoming strength. Mm. Amen. And count vulnerability as one of the indicators of sort of overcoming. Mm. Oh, I love that. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Emmy, for being here today. If you are listening to this story, you may also be interested in checking out a written version of what we've just talked about, which is going to be in a newsletter called askdrdevikab.substack.com. That's A-S-K-D-R-D-E-V-I-K-A dot S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K dot com. Thank you so much, Emmy, and thanks for spreading the light and everything that you do. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me.